All right, folks, so this week's course is called The Raven at Snowshoe Mountain. It is a West Virginia course, and this is a course which has been on my radar since I saw it in the Top 100 Golf uh, website. It is ranked, I believe it's fifth in the state of, fifth or twelfth, one of the two, um, in West Virginia. Now, why it's ranked 5th or 12th or instead of 49th or 132nd, I don't know. But it's a, it's a course that's uh, designed by the Gary Player Architectural Golf Design Company, if not Gary Player himself. And I've played on a couple of Gary Player Company design courses, and they do tend to be rather tight. Off the tee and fairway and around the greens, there, there's... Um, very challenging courses in the sense that um, one has to be very careful on every shot or they don't, there's not a lot of room on the sides um, for slightly offline shots, very good at gobbling up balls. And so when I saw the description of the um, course on the internet, I decided that I wanted to play it. It was up on my, on my um, board list of courses to play. It was not that far away from D.C. It's only um, roughly a four-hour drive, um, according to Google Maps. And having played um, Primlin first, this is one of the courses I wanted to play last year, but I didn't get a chance to play it before uh, the winter season began or before they closed the course for the winter. Much like Primlin, Snowshoe is a um, year-round resort kind of um, place, and obviously in the winter, I don't know if you know sh Snowshoe, if you've heard of Snowshoe, but it's a, it's a ski resort in the winter. And in the spring, summer, and fall, they have a bunch of other activities. Uh, it's a, let's say, more bohemian kind of place than Primlin, definitely not as expensive. And uh, so... It's really not nearly as expensive to get on the golf course there, but their snow season um, did begin, or the, the winter season began in, in November, right around the end of October, uh, early November, and it uh, lasted until, I believe it was April, uh, no, no, May. They started the golf course in um, on May 6th of this year. And for the first week, it's going to be three days only, Thursday, um, Saturdays, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, or three days off, sorry. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday off, it's closed. And so it's four days open for um, 6th of May until, I believe it's the 16th of May. And then after that, it'll be uh, seven days a week until uh, October, late October. But the price of the course will go up dramatically. It will roughly double um, before 1230 um, during the week and now is a great time to catch the course I, I got there uh, let's see uh, 9:30 and 8 30 8 30 right on my tea time after a four-hour drive out of DC took me seriously took me four and a half hours to get there just as Google Maps played but I, I want to tell you I was hauling ass trying to get to this course from about um, about 5:30 to when I got to the course. Literally, you know, like like uh, the Deuce of Hazard, you know, running through these back roads and up these hills, and and it's not it's not a short drive. I ended up taking this. The reason I'm saying this is because I, I don't want people to have to duplicate this experience. But if you go west from this town, which I believe is Staunton, which I'm not 100% sure. Then you head out towards Snowshoe and, and the Raven. The problem is that it's about an hour and a half drive from DC out 66 down 81 to this town, which is north of Waynesboro, which is where 64 runs into 81. Okay, Blacksburg's on the other side of that, Roanoke's on the other side of that, uh, south of that. Um, if you go west from there, it's like you're taking a right triangle so you're coming down the um the 90 degree turn to go west out towards snowshoe that is the longest route that one would take to go there heading south straight down 81 and then west straight to snowshoe the problem is there's no real road that goes straight from
from Stoughton to Snowshoe. Even if it looks like that when you look at MapQuest or whatever, when you look at the whole route, route coming from DC down, out 66, down 81, and in west, trust me, it is not straight, <laughs> okay? It is anything but straight. Anything. And I spent the next two and a half hours, I would swear to God, on like a rally circuit, driving west from Stoughton to Snowshoe. It is only 140-something miles from Stoughton to Snowshoe. I'm assuming, assuming live, bear with me, and it's Stoughton is it the right town. It may not be Stoughton. It might be uh, some other town than us. Okay, let's just say. But the town is just west of Massanutten. Um, it is 141 miles that way to go to, um, to Snowshoe. A little south and then back north, and then you come up and around on 219, you come up and around from the west to get in Snowshoe. That's probably the longest route that you'll see on any reasonable direction-finding map. There's a, a slightly shorter route as you go north back up towards Harrisburg. I believe it's Harrisburg. It's on 81 where JMU is. Um, okay, so you go from Harrisburg to Snowshoe, it's like 109 miles. If you come north of Stoughton and go west, it's like 118 miles. The road I took was on the west side of Stoughton because I didn't want to go off 81 while it was still dark. I waited till it was light enough to see to do that. And sure enough, as I'm driving through what was at the point I'm a reasonably straight back road, a reasonably decent speed, like 45 miles an hour, you know, something like that, in the morning, you know, light on a tree-covered road, you know, past some houses and stuff, sure enough, this big-ass buck um, doe comes out of the, the, the road to the left, saunters into the road where I'm coming, you know, saunters into my path. As I come closer and closer to it, it accelerates, and then it goes dashing off the street after I stop my car. <laughs> okay. Not the first time. The last time I was driving around in Virginia, in, in, in anywhere south of, you know, um, 66, anywhere, anywhere south of 66, the, in the morning light, the last time I actually did hit a baby deer with my car, but luckily this deer was small enough that it just jumped on the hood of my car. It wasn't going so fast. Probably broke its leg, but it, it came up, it slid up the hood of my car, halfway up the windshield and rolled off the side and then walked away. The last thing I wanted to do, and I was afraid of this the whole way down in the morning, was hitting a deer on 81 at 4 o'clock in the morning at 70 miles an hour. So I was really happy to get off 81 within one piece. But then I had to worry about driving from Stoughton, 81, basically, all the way out to Snowshoe. And it was, I swear to God, one of the most exhausting drives I've ever had in my life to drive that. 140 miles because within 20 miles of getting off the highway i said i'm not going to make my tea time there's no way i'm going to make my tea time i was thinking i'd be two hours you know to get to the course or more and and i was right it was about two hours to get to the course from there um but at the time it was like i think it was 6 30 i ended up Getting there just at my tea time. Literally, the driving time was exactly right. You know, getting there right at 9.30. And thankfully, I had seen frost on the way up to the course. And I figured, well, there'll be a frost delay. And I'll get, a, you know, there'll be like at least a half an hour, an hour frost delay and something like that. So that was good and bad at the same time because it meant that I had time to um, get there and make my tea time. But bad because it meant that I would be starting late and I wouldn't have time to finish the entire 18 holes. So I was worried about that. Luckily, luckily, we're sitting out there, they're yeehawing over the radio and stuff and back and forth, and the guy looks at me and says, why don't you go ahead and out here because you're single. Go out there, you know, and, and um, give it a shot. And so it was like, I didn't see any frost. I think I, we, I got out at 9.15. I didn't see any frost. But the course was really kind of, you know, kind of the first hole <laughs> is not an easy hole. Let me just put it that way. Not an easy hole uh, the second hole was um, a little easier, still pretty tight. Um, I, had, I lost four balls between the first two holes. Uh, the third hole I lost a ball on. That was a par three. 
110 yards, par three. I lost the ball on that off the tee. And I was starting to get a little bit worried and a little bit pissed because I'd only brought like 10 or 10 balls with me and already lost five. So um, I settled in, essentially settled in. Luckily, those first three holes were real ball busters for that course. I mean, they, they were kind of among the hardest holes in the course, if not the hardest holes in the course. And after that, the course um, settled down, was, was a, a opened up a little bit, was a little easier. The next tee shot um, from the top of that ridge had to be 100 feet up in the air, you know, down to that diagonal fairway. Uh, after that, there was a straight tee shot to an uphill fairway to a green that was uphill, elevated to the right. And I mean, it was, it, it, it kind of calmed down after that. It was pretty, pretty cool. It was a nice course, definitely fun, definitely challenging. Definitely had some surprises where you, if you couldn't see where you were hitting, it is best to assume that if you hit there, you will not be able to find your ball. Let's put it that way, okay? You need to hit the ball where you can see, and if you do that, you'll probably be fine. So that was really the only challenge there. And, you know, the question was just, can you do that? So I'd say it was another 15 holes of that going around. Um, it was a good challenge. I would say the course had a lot of nice holes on it, a lot of holes that were tough, a lot of holes that were not so tough, but none of them were really easy. Um, I think there may have been one hole on the backside that was a, just a straightforward, you know, 390 par 4 that was really, you know, on the easy side, but the rest of the course was, you know, challenging to say the least. I won't say it was super duper tough. It was not the hardest holes I've ever seen. It wasn't the most difficult course I've ever played, but consider the fact that this was a slope 141 course from the back tees without having really tough greens. That's how tough the course was. Uh, a lot of the greens on this course were level with the fairway or you could pitch and run off from say 50 yards up and pitch and run up the center. Um, some of the holes had uh, steep drop offs in the back of the greens. Some of them were up elevated greens, but none of them were really tough greens to play. They certainly had none of the high slope and heavy drama and stuff going on. Um, the, obviously there was a hole on the front side, um, at least two holes on the front side where the greens were not that easy to get to. Otherwise I wouldn't have lost so many balls in the first five holes, first three holes. Five balls, first three holes. So it wasn't an easy course to play, but it was a well-level, balanced, fair course. And a good challenge. Had some nice um, view lines, uh, sights of view from the course. Um, not an a unattractive course at all. Not a super well, obviously it wasn't well-maintained course in a sense that the greens, a lot of the greens were, were um, split up and so forth. Um, some of them were okay. Some actually were pretty decent shape, but a lot of them had um, some some cracked greens and things like that that I took a picture of to, because they were in such um, bad condition. There was a lot of dandelions out in the course. The grass was, the rough was fairly long. So it, it was not in, you know, country club condition at all, okay? Um, it was decent. It was playable, but it wasn't like great. Some of the, some, you know, like even the putting green in front of the course, I didn't even really bother putting on more than, you know, two or three poles because it was so cracked up. Uh, there were a fair number of greens in the course that were like that also. And you could definitely tell the rough hadn't been cut in, in a while. Uh, certainly that's, uh, it, I think it's been cut. Once you can see out there, there were marks where they'd have lawnmowers out there um, and uh, left skid marks out there. But probably not cut very you know, much, if at all. And um, I, I really think that the course was uh, quite worth the money, considering it was $50 with a cart to play it on Saturday at 8.30, 30 in the morning. It was a really good deal, honestly. And I would, would say that the only real problem with this course is the fact that it is in the middle of a mountain range. There, there was a 3,000-foot mountain that I drove through, and it had like a whole town and stuff up there, um, that I drove through on the way south out of there. 3,000 foot. It was like Denver playing this course in some ways. So it was, it was great for a couple things. It was a good challenge to golf. It was a good change of pace. It was a good drive. 
and the roads the roads are really kind of cool for driving if i had my motorcycle i would have been fine just driving out there on my bike and riding back um just i just would never want to drive in west virginia in the evening or night uh, i did that one time when i wanted to play the woods i came back from the course and it was dark that was the last time i would ever want to drive in west virginia at night it's just really hard to deal with those roads at night and I, I wouldn't want to do it again um but other than that it was great it was a lot of fun and um i am going to give this course a um a minus the reason i'm going to give it an a minus is because it was a good challenging course a good layout some very good shots very i would say borderline unique shots very nice shots out on the course but it wasn't in great condition and I give that to the fact that it was early for the course. It was the first week it was open, and it, it just isn't going to be in its best condition. And on top of that, I got on the course for 50 bucks In the summer, in, the, in, in a month or two, it's going to be $90 for the same tea time, same ticket, before, um, I think, 2 o'clock. Like, I put the price up in front. It's going to get a lot more expensive this summer because this course, I think, is absolutely worth the money. I wouldn't I would not put my finger on a course like this where it is getting ninety dollars for a tea time on a weekend unless it was worth that ninety dollars. And not like a course like Primlin, which wanted $120 for a tea time two weeks ago, okay, which was just almost immaculate condition even two weeks earlier, okay. Consider that this course was a slope 141 course from the Blue Tees, and Primlin was a slope 150 course from the Back Tees. They were both from the Black Tees, I'm sorry. Um, how is Primlin worth two and a half times the cost of this course? How? Yes, it's a nicer course. Yes, it's a nicer layout. Yes, it's, it's also bigger. And yes, it also has houses on it. Both courses did have the occasional houses here and there. Um, certainly, there was one fairway where I drove up on 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 the Raven, where I, you drive, hit your ball the fairway, drive up the fairway, look, there's a big house to the left. Um, that did happen a couple times. There's no question that there are houses on the. I would say maybe five houses on the course on for each one. Okay, out of 18 holes, and it, it's I don't see how it was worth two and a half times the cost of this course. So I think that it, at the very least, while they might be competitive in terms of the play, certainly Primlin had harder greens, absolutely, but absolutely it was also $120 to play it compared to $50. And it was an hour farther drive from DC compared to <laughs> compared to um, to uh, the Raven. So in this in the larger scheme of things, with everything else being equal, I have to give the Raven at least as good a score as I gave Primlin. And I, I, I think that is both logical, logically derived, and it feels like the right thing. I mean, I would not say that, that the Raven was in anywhere near, I mean, it wasn't bad. It, trust me, it wasn't awful. It just wasn't what it you know should have been with the Greens. Um, I would not say in, in, in that sense that Primlin was such better shape of a course that it was worth uh, two and a half times as much to play the course. Okay, what I will give Primlin credit for is having GPS on the on the carts, and Primlin had the most rudimentary of markers. They had lines painted on the cart pass, was really the biggest thing I could see. But you know that's fine if you if you <laughs> see the line on the cart path, you walk to your car to your ball or you drive to your ball, whatever. That's enough. You don't need too much more. You don't need it to be it's 108 yards and um, approximately 18 inches with the wind direction and the exact elevation you know, slope up to the green. And so, I don't need that kind of information to play golf. I don't need what I, I don't need is exact yardage. What I would like to have is a course map. And the one advantage that having GPS courses um, on, a, on a cart is you get a course map. So when you play a course you've never played for, you at least have a map. Um, now you can get that on your phone. You know, as I understand, you can get a course map for every course in the United States on your phone. I don't 
I, I did spend enough time playing with my phone, taking pictures as it is. I don't want to be playing with a, a GPS map also. It would have saved me a couple of balls on some shots. But overall, it's nice to not know exactly what's out there when you're on a tee. You play by eye. I'm, I'm cool with that. So a, an A- minus for this course, the Raven. Not trying to kiss anyone's ass or butter up somebody at the course. This course had a lot of issues. I mean, the clubhouse was old. You know, it's been a, while, a bit of a while since it's been renovated, if ever. Um, the greens were in, you know, at best, playable condition for a lot of the greens. Some of them weren't even that, really. I mean, I wouldn't say there was any of them where I picked the ball up and walked off in disgust. But when your putting green is all cracked up, that's not a good sign. Um, and certainly that was like, it was like that for many of the holes. Anyway, that's restating the obvious. The course is not in some, you know, wonderful um, resort environment. Um, it wasn't in a, a super attractive environment to drive up to the course. But it was a good course. And it was a good drive up there, I would say, more than an impressive destination. Uh, so an A- minus for the Raven. And it's Snowshoe, West Virginia, which is a four and a half hour drive away from DC. And I would say give yourself four and a half hours if you go to play this course in the DC area. It is quite a drive. I, I, I must, I cannot hardly understate this. You will have had a drive to get to this course. The, the, the time is an understatement compared to the difficulty. And in, that's 20 minutes, and that's enough for any course. So A-minus for the Raven in Snowshoe, West Virginia.